It's a good lead, but it's not a winning lead just let. Both Leclerc and Matsuda are coming at him. Can Phelps hang on and get a 15th gold medal? Will he be the first male ever to win the same event at the Olympics? On three occasions, Leclerc and Matsuda are closing. It's going to be close. Phelps is hanging on. He's a winner. Does he touch? He doesn't. Leclerc touched because Phelps got it wrong on the line. It's unbelievable. Matsuda's third. It's a shocking upset. Can you take us through the race? I just remember it. It's just like it's been in my genes for the last four years, you know. Michael Phelps is my hero and uh, I just wanted to race him in the final and uh, I just wanted to win so bad. Uh, I can't believe it. What does this mean to you and your family? Uh, you don't understand what this means. Uh, you know, this is like the greatest moment of my life. I don't think I could ever beat this moment. Chad Leclerc, <laughs> how do you feel when you hear that? <laughs> that uh, brings back such great memories, you know. Um, if you listen to the end there when I touched the wall, the crowd went silent and you heard me go, yes! We won. <laughs> and that's because, uh, you know, I think all the 21,000 people <laughs> couldn't believe that I'd just beaten Phelps. But, uh, yeah, and it's, it's, it's amazing uh, to think back, um, you know, nearly eight years ago. It uh, was, you know, obviously the best moment of my career and, and, and my life. But, uh, yeah, just a very emotional day for, for all of us. <laughs> the commentary, I suppose you hear there, you don't choose the commentary. They, they seemed almost stunned. It was, you get the feeling they didn't quite give you the credit you deserved. It was more like he made a mistake rather than Chad Leclerc won the race. Yeah, it was crazy. I mean, you know, I watched that race, honestly, every single day for at least a year after the Olympics. You know, I'm not, I'm not ashamed to admit it. Me and my dad and my family would, would get together, watch it. We had it recorded on the TV at, you know, at home at Super Sports and go on YouTube and everyone would cheer again. Ah! And got like crazy people. You must see when there's a party at the house. I promise you, when there's, especially when there's a few drinks around. My dad and everyone starts crying again. Everyone starts crying and cheering like it's like it's like it's loud. <laughs> no, look, I think <laughs> I think people were stunned. Obviously, the commentators were definitely stunned, and uh, you know sometimes that's how it goes. Um, you know, I think back in 2008 when Phelps won by this pr pretty similar margin to win his eighth gold medal against uh, Kavic in the hundred fly. Mm. You know, they said they 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 you know they didn't say that Kavic made a mistake, even though he clearly did make a mistake. You know, so. Yeah. Uh, I guess slightly, I wouldn't say biased, but, you know, it would have been nicer to say, you know, a bit more, let's say, cheerful for the young South African at the time. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. But the butterfly is such a, a tricky race because you've got to time your stroke, haven't you? And do you know exactly how many strokes you're going to do in a race or does it vary? So to be honest with you, I'm I'm one of the few butterfly swimmers out there that don't really time or count or worry too much about that. You know, a lot of swimmers focus on stroke, uh, stroke rate, stroke tempo, a uh, number of strokes per 50. Um, I actually heard something very interesting a couple of months ago. They said that Phelps, if he did uh, 19 strokes, it means that he was going 29 seconds for that, that 50. If he went 18 strokes, 28, 17 strokes, 27, you know, so on. So it was crazy. He said like almost every single time he did that, 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 that that's, that's what his split was in the turn of fly. So he knew at always what splits that he was going in the race, which is crazy to think. But for me, I don't, I'm not the type of swimmer that's very technical type of type of base. You know, I like to just kind of be more free and, and race the race more than anything and not really worry about, let's say, times, so to speak. You know, so I don't stand on the block and say, I'm going to go 17 strokes the first 50, 18 strokes the second 50, and then 20 and 20. You know, I'm just kind of racing the race and mm. kind of seeing how it goes. How much mental degradation is there? I mean, in, in the sense that how much do you try and psych out your opponents in that in the waiting room beforehand or on the blocks when you come out? Is there, is there quite a, an amount of sort of that mental stuff that goes on between the swimmers behind the scenes? Um, I think definitely, definitely there is. Um, from my side, you know, it's kind of weird, you know, because looking back over the last couple of years, I've kind of, I wouldn't say I'm necessarily worried about other people, but I've always been very wary of them. So like for me, if you watch a lot of my races, I'm always looking around and stuff like that. And that's not because I'm, that's just kind of for me, you know, so it's like almost added motivation for me. But in terms of like the core room and stuff, I mean, I remember back in 2016, I'm sure everyone saw that, mm. <laughs> that stupid thing that I, that I was doing there. But <laughs> that wasn't that wasn't that wasn't me trying to psych out anybody. That was literally me in the semifinals after winning an Olympic silver medal uh, with my buddy James Gar having a laugh like the camera. If the camera had shown us 10 minutes before, they would have seen him do something similar, you know. Yeah. So we didn't even know Phelps was there. It was kind of like. This was 10 minutes before the semi-final of the turn of fly. So I wasn't trying to do it out of, 
you know, psyching it out. I know everyone they made those memes made out of it, and people were, you know. <laughs> well, just for the listeners who might not have seen it, Phelps gave you a bit of a death death clear, didn't he, in the in the call room? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was it was crazy. You know, look, if I if I take it back, honestly speaking, you know, we had a huge rivalry going into that because in 2015, when he was, uh, I think he was suspended for 12 months, so he couldn't swim. And let me take it even back further than that. We were, I mean, I love Phelps, right? Let me start from the beginning. He was, he was my hero of heroes. You know, I really do. Yeah. I loved everything about the guy, you know, and then 2012 we raced and I beat him and, you know, he was really, really nice at the time and he was gracious in defeat and we, we hung out afterwards and I, I, I really looked up to the guy and then he obviously retired for a couple of years and then the bad blood just came out of nowhere in 2015 where I, I raced the world championships in Kazan and he raced in America a day later. The U.S. trials or something, wasn't it? U.S. trials, yeah. So it was really weird because, I mean, I had no beef with him at all. Um, I just remember him saying something uh, the week before, saying like, oh, since I've retired, the butterfly events have got really slow. Mm. So for me, I kind of, I kind of, I felt quite offended by that because like for me, firstly, he's the greatest of all time, right? He's the, he's the Muhammad Ali of boxing or the Mayweather of boxing, you know, whichever way you want to look at it. And you know, of course, when he retired, the swimming events have got slower, you know, I mean, he, he set the world alight, but for me, you shouldn't be saying that, you know, as, as a champion, yeah, you can't say that, you know what I mean? Like when, one day when I retire, you know, with respect, I'm, you know, the, the best Olympian in South Africa, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, when I'm done, it'll be like that. You know, when I retire from swimming, I'm not going to say, oh, now that I've retired, swimming's gone backwards. Mm-hmm. You know, that's not what you say, you know, as a champion, that's not what you say. No. So for me, I just felt a little bit upset about that. And kind of what happened was I swam a time that was faster than he's ever done in like eight years. Right, the hundred fly, yeah. And I just, I like went close, really close to his world record, which was in the suits. So, I all I said was to one of the American NBCs, I just said, "Hey guys, so they're like, hey, what do you think of Phelps? What he just said?" And they played it to me, and I was like, "Well, look, firstly, that's not, you know, it's not very cool what he said." You know, I said, "Look, guys, I've just done a time he hasn't done in eight years, so he can say whatever he likes." <laughs> then, <laughs> funny enough. Seven hours later, he raced line and fly, and he beat me by like three one hundredths of a second, which was an amazing swim by him. I'm not taking anything away, but then that's when the whole rivalry began, right? And all the swimmers kind of were like, "Oh, you know." And for me, it was it was really weird because I wasn't, I don't, I don't, I don't have any bad things to say about Phelps. You know, I think, you know, like I say, he he gave me so much motivation in my career, and I think it was just kind of things were taken completely out of context. Yeah, and that's when it kind of all began, and he. You know, then we kind of went on to saying stuff in the media, which was, from my side, things were twisted completely. I mean, especially in the American media, you know, I wasn't, half the stuff they were writing about me there was, I mean, I guess it was selling the Olympics and selling the racing. And I guess it was statistically the most viewed racing yeah. uh, when me and Phelps raced, which was great. You know, I, you know, it is what it is. But, you know, some of the stuff was really uh, not not what I said, definitely. Phelps being the champion that he is and the amount of gold medals he's won in the medals, he, he elevated swimming to to a high a high level in terms of viewership and in terms of you know, people wanting to get involved in the sport. Then you came along and beat him. It was the first time, I think we must make this clear for the listeners, that he had lost the 200-meter fly in a decade in in t- London in 2012. So that must have really stung him because it was a it was an event he owned. No one no one beat Michael Phelps over 200 meters in the butterfly, did they? No, not at all. It's exactly what you said. You know, For me, yeah, he was undefeated in 10 years. I mean, he had, he's had, he had the world record for 10 years. You know what I mean? He... He broke it in, uh, in uh, no, 11 years, actually. He broke it in 2001. I actually remember watching that race in Fukuruka in Japan, you know. So for me, I think that's what was really, um, I think that's what also elevated me, uh, you know, into this, you know, I don't want to say it in an <laughs> arrogant way or anything, but like I became quite popular and, you know, mm. especially in the swimming world. And I think for me, um, it was really amazing because the, the, the way that we prepared for that was, you know, of course, there was a small element of luck of, you know, the touch. Sure. But I prepared so well for that race. I'd visualize, I'd thought about that exact sequence a mm. hundred thousand times before that race actually happened. You know, people, people think that it was a flu. People think that I, I stood on the block hoping for, you know, hoping for a bronze, you know, or whatever. Yeah, of course I would have, would I have taken a bronze? I probably would have, if you had asked me uh, a week before the Olympics, but, you know, when I'm standing on the block, I, I wouldn't have taken bronze. I was I was confident I was going to go out there and, and win or just be very close thereabouts, you know. So, you know, just the way that it was planned out. And, and I think the, the preparation that me and my coach did at the time, we prepared to come over the top of him the last 50. No one had ever done that to him, you know. Well, I was going to ask you about that because you, you were probably half a body length behind him at the turn, uh, which is a big margin to make up 
uh, you know, against anybody, but especially against Phelps. Did you feel, did you sense he was fading? Or were you going faster? I don't know how it works. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. It's, it's a good question. I think at the time, you know, that race was such a weird, it was such a weird day, guys. I tell you, I was, I remember even a couple of hours before, you know, the race, I went to see my coach in his room and he was, you know, he was scalping his wife and kids and we were just chatting and it was like a normal, you know, it was a normal Tuesday for us. Normal Tuesday night. We're just like, I remember Haley saying to Graham, like, oh, you, aren't you guys nervous? And we looked at each other. We're like, no, we're not really nervous. I mean, this was like three, three and a half hours before the race, you know? Yeah. And I mean, there was just a sense of, of calmness you know it was like we knew what we needed to do we there was no real need, need to be nervous because we didn't really have anything to lose but also we we were very confident in what the game plan and uh we we're confident that we we're going to execute you know so coming down the stretch with at 150 no one had ever beaten Phelps in any race if they had touched behind them with 15 minutes to go that that's a fact you can go check that so for me it was just really special because i knew that no one was going to expect that. And, and I knew that if I, 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 look, I was very fit going into 2012. You know, I, I trained like an absolute, absolute dog. I, 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 you know, we were just at the peak of fitness, you know, and I think I wasn't as speedy and as, um, let's say, skillful as I am now, but I was definitely the fittest in the field. And a turn of fly is an absolute dog fight. Yeah. If you ask coaches around the world, you just have to be tough as nails. I, I remember saying to my dad and, People won't believe me when I say this, but I, I told my dad in 20, 2008, you know, I said, Dad, this is this turn of fly. I wasn't even a proper turn of fly but swimmer back then. I said, this is the race I'm going to excel at one day. Really? I was swimming breaststroke and four in the middle at the time, but I said turn of fly because I could I could sense it was a it was a real, how do you say it, like a warrior's race. You know, it was just a, it was, a, it was awesome. It's awesome to be a part of, you know, it's just, it's, it, it takes speed, it takes endurance, it takes heart. So you've got to have a decent game plan, but at the end of the day, you've got to be tough coming down the stretch, you know? So for me... Going back to that race, I remember coming down and touching at the 150, and um, we prepared for that moment. We were ready for it, you know. We 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 came off that last wall, and I say we because it was a team effort. We prepared for it, you know. And and and, and I came off that underwater, and everything just kind of went slow. I promise you, I was coming down last 25, and I'm just I'm I'm feeling me catching Phelps. I had a quick look over, and I saw that it was only 0.3 or 0.4 behind. And I'm like, come on, man, I'm gonna catch him here. And obviously, coming down the last 10 meters, you know, when I put my head down. Truth be told, I didn't know if I'd won. I actually thought that I got silver. But when I touched the wall and I saw gold, it was just, <laughs> it was uh, it was a feeling I can't really describe, to be very honest with you. I mean, for those of us, a lot of people do casual swimming to stay fit, and it's, it's really tough. I mean, it, it, you know, just swimming up and down. But in the heat of the battle, you've got to stay composed. Do you have things that go wrong? Uh, you dive in and your goggles come loose and water gets into your eye or your cap comes over your ear or those kind of things. Does that happen? And has it happened in big championships? Yeah, absolutely. It, it happens all the time. You know, I think I always like to say you must be prepared for the unexpected, you know. Embrace the chaos, I always say. The week of Olympics, you have to embrace the chaos because there's so many things that happen around you outside of the pool. And there's more, more than inside the pool. Look, of course... It does happen. You have a terrible start or you have a terrible turn or you swallow a bit of water coming off the turn because sometimes, you know, when you in those Olympic finals, especially over the shorter distances, there's a lot of waves, yeah. especially in freestyle and butterfly, you know, so coming off the wall, if you, if you breathe too low and you're, and you don't, you take your breath a little bit too early, you are swallowing, you know, <laughs> 300 moles of water, you know? Yeah. So of course it's happened a few times, but um, at the end of the day, you have to be prepared for it. And I think, that's what makes uh, Olympics so special, you know, because you only have four years to get it right. You know, I think, you know, even if I'm talking about different events like 2016, I think a lot of things went wrong for me outside of the pool, uh, maybe some somewhat inside of the pool. But, you know, you know, it is what it is. You know, you can't make excuses about it. You can't, uh, you know, you have to you have to take it on the chin. You know, you have to take your wins on the chin and your losses on the chin. You can't have the good and the bad, you know, you can't... Uh... Yeah, well, look, it's not only, your career is not only about the Olympics, you've obviously excelled at the World Championships and at the Commonwealth Games and all those things, but I suppose the Olympic Games are the pinnacle of the sport for swimming. And 2016, you had your issues, as you mentioned, I think both your parents went through cancer, which is, you know, massively, must have been massively distressing for anyone, never mind someone who's preparing for the Olympics, plus you've got this whole Phelps thing going on. You know, in 2016, you still, you know, pick up two silver medals. The big rematch with Phelps, I think, ended in bronze for you in, on, on that occasion. Uh, was that, let's just talk about that race, the 2016 200 fly, uh, and he didn't win either. I think uh, someone else won that race. Do, was that an, uh, an anticlimax, that, that 200 fly, the rematch, and, and maybe you didn't achieve the same sort of standard you did four years earlier? You know, it was a weird week for me because obviously, look, 
I don't want to like again. I'm not making excuses, you know. Like obviously, my parents had cancer. It was a, it was a tough time for my family. I don't want to say it was for me because it was tough for my brothers, my sister, the whole family. You know, we we're very close and uh, more more tough for my parents. You know, and I think you know, like my mom was very bad at the time. Uh, my dad, you know, had prostate cancer. My mom, you know, I was it was a really tough time for us. Um, I think the Olympics. Looking back on it now, it was it was a huge success. You know, I look I look at it and I, I kept saying that to you afterwards, it was terrible, it was terrible. But looking back now, it was a huge success considering what happened. It was a win for me because of the way I swam it, firstly, because of where I came from. I was ranked like number 22nd or 23rd in the world. And not many people gave me a chance. And I was prepared for that, you know, because, you know, people thought that, um, you know, I could only swim butterfly back then and it was only going to be me and Phelps and the uh, turtle flies. But I, I was really confident I could go out there and shock the world and swim a freestyle. You know, again, I must give credit to my coach at the time. He uh, he gave me a lot of confidence after the semifinals because, you know, going off that semifinal, I was seated seventh, and it was yeah. You only sort of just made it through as uh, one of the fastest losers, right? Scraped it through, yeah. man. I was I scraped it through exactly. But you know, I, I employed a tactic that no one ever did. You know, so I went out like a like an absolute caveman <laughs> <laughs> the first hundred. You know, so yeah, it was uh, it was a tactic. It was almost like I, I went for the knockout in the first round. If you if you attribute to boxing, you know, and I think I pretty much got it, except for drugs came past me the last fifty meters. You know, yeah. Sun Yang, unfortunately. And again, I'm not. This is not having. This is not a personal attack on him. I don't know him well at all. And uh, you know, he had failed uh, two drug tests in 2014. Yeah. So everyone knew that he was uh, he was dirty. You know. So for me, I, I was I, I I celebrated that that silver medal like it was a gold medal because firstly it was a huge uh, national record, African record, personal best. Um, amazing swim, but also just the fact that I got on the podium for a race that was considered a, you know, I was not considered a, a good freestyler. Yeah. It was a huge, huge plus for me. So heading into that turn of fly, I was, I was very confident, you know, I was, I was confident I was going to win. I was, I was confident I was going to get close to the world record. There was a couple of things that happened from that night, you know, 36 hours later when I swam the turn of fly final. Unfortunately, I can't reveal too much because that would be me making uh, excuses in some other people's books, but uh, something did happen outside the pool, which you know I'll discuss if I win next year. <laughs> okay, <laughs> well, hold you to that. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. But 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 I, what I will say is, you know, Phelps did win that turn of fly, and I came fourth. And I have to take my my hat off to him, you know, because even though I do believe that I I lost that race in some respects, even though I came fourth and I didn't come second, I have to take my hat off, and I have to respect the fact that he came back and he. He won back that race, you know. You got to respect that, even though the time was slow, the race was slow. It was just, it was a hard, it was a hard night for me. It was, a, it was, a, it was, it was the worst race I've ever had, you know. I would say in my career, and 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 there were many reasons why. And it wasn't, it wasn't psychological. It wasn't emotional. I was, I wasn't, uh, yeah. You know, maybe I was, maybe I was a tad angry, emotional, or ready to win the race. But it wasn't. That wasn't the reason I lost. You know, people would think that it was psychological. One hundred percent was not. You know, but. Um, it is what it is, you know. When when the history books are written, they're not going to say. Yeah, there's no reasons. There's no but to being Olympic champion. You know, you either are Olympic champion or you're Olympic silver medalist or you're not. Yeah. You know, there's no oh, Chad's parents had cancer or he or whatever. Let's just say he slipped in the block or he had a bad turn. There's there's, there's no need for that. You know, I see a lot of these champions. I'm not going to mention names, but I see a lot of these guys that make excuses about having bad starts and bad turns after they lose races. And I just look at it and I just, I just, I just, it just takes your power away when you see that, you know, I lose respect for people when they say that, because I promise you now, not everybody has a perfect race. Mm. There's no such thing. It doesn't exist in my eyes. Yeah. It doesn't exist. I, I, that's why for me, I race the race, you know, yes, every night again, if you look in 2012, I didn't hit all my turns perfectly, but I don't go and say that, you know, you know what I'm trying to say? Like, yeah, I had the, okay. The finish was absolutely perfect. Right. <laughs> was uh, absolutely perfect. But, but, you know, it's never going to be perfect, you know. So at the end of the day, there's always something that you can work on and be better at. So, yes, you can come out and say, oh, I could have done that better. I should have done that better. But you can't come out and say, oh, I lost the race because of my start. It was atrocious, you know. And I think for me, I see a lot of swimmers do that. And I think it's, it's, a, it's a terrible example to the youth. And, and, and that's why, you know, whenever I'm talking to the kids and, and stuff like that, I always make that very clear. Please, guys. Learn that from young. We don't make excuses. Win, lose, or draw. It doesn't matter. We 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 uh, lose with grace, and we we win with grace. Fantastic. And and Sung Yang has now been banned for eight years. Uh, the man who won the two hundred meter freestyle at the twenty sixteen Olympics. I understand it that the International Olympic Committee and and WADA, the World Anti Doping Agency, do keep your samples for um, a decade or so uh, from these things. So, is there any possibility that 
if he was doping at the time and retrospectively they find that you might be awarded the gold medal how would you feel if that did happen would it would it feel like a gold how, how i'm not saying it will happen this is hypothetical but if something like that were to transpire yes would you take it i think it's a weird one you know because you you lose the moment firstly of being olympic champion singing the national anthem uh, having all the perks afterwards of sponsorships and endorsement deals and blah 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 etc cetera, etc cetera. for me um the only reason I'd, I'd want to get that gold medal back is not for the gold medal. I just want it on my record. So, for example, if I break my leg tomorrow and I can't swim, yeah, uh, I feel like my record should say two Olympic gold medals, two Olympic silver medals. It shouldn't say three silvers, one bronze, one gold. Yeah, you know, individual. You know, so you know, that's the only reason why. Other than that, I don't really mind. Um, it's not that he was doping at the Olympics because I think, from what I understand, again, I'm no expert on anything like this, mm. but. The people don't dope at the Olympics. They dope before. Yeah. You know, that's why he got caught now last year, uh, eight weeks before the world champs. He was smashing vials eight, eight, eight weeks before the world champs. So if I, if I ask you a question, you're, you're, you're a clean man, right? You come and knock on my door. You say you from anti-doping. You come take my blood. You, you Craig, you come and take my blood, right? You don't have any, authority, but you just show me some fake thing and you take my blood. What difference does it make if you have my blood or not? Would I, would I really risk it? And for example, let's just say you don't have the correct paperwork, whatever it is. I'm not going to go and get my bodyguard or my brother or somebody to smash the valves with a hammer. Yeah. In other words, what, what are you trying to hide, right? What do you, what, what, what's the... Yeah, it's not a good look, is it? What's the, what's the, <laughs> what, 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 what happens there? You know, so, so if you're a clean man, what do you, what do you got to hide? Exactly. You know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, yeah. Was he doping during the 2016 Olympics? Probably not because people don't really dope. They're not doping to be fast at the Olympics. They're doping so that they can recover better. And train better. You know what yeah. I'm trying to say? They, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, and, and again, you didn't get caught for, in 2014, you didn't get caught for something small like, uh, let's just say, you take, you take a demazine, you know, like for your nose and throat by mistake. So it's got pseudoephedrine and you, you over pseudoephedrine. That, 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 that can definitely be a little mistake sometimes. You know, again, it's, 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 I'm not sure on this front, but if you, if you get caught for EPO testosterone, that's, that has to be injected. Conscious decision. Exactly. You know, you're injecting it. You can't, you know, it's, it's pathetic, some of these excuses, you know. So at the end of the day, they've got people behind them and doctors and stuff like that that probably monitor all this stuff. And it's, it's, um, it's very sad because it's not just me that loses out on the gold medal. It's, it's James Carr who loses out on an on a Olympic bronze medal. Yeah. Who he, has, he, he hadn't had go, no Olympic medals before then. It's the guy that came ninth. Who could have been an Olympic finalist? Yeah, there's a guy that could have been an 18 year old or 17 year old from some small country that finished 17th, and they could have been an Olympic semi finalist. And maybe who knows? Yeah, exactly. Could have nicked them there in the final, and that's life changing, my friend. You know, which, whichever way you want to spin it, yeah, it's not really about me only. It's about other people, and it's about the the, the generations that you've killed. You know, you, I mean, he won double, he won a double gold in London. He won the 400 free and the 1500 free, and he got a silver medal in the 200 free. So, think about all those people. I mean, there's a guy Ryan Cochran who's a, who's in a Canadian guy, he retired after London. He got two silver medals to Sun Yang. I mean, he should be a double Olympic champion. Yeah, and that could have changed his life. Huh? Of course it would have changed your life. I mean, if I never won in 2012, I mean, my life is completely different just because of 2012. I mean, it's still, it's eight years ago, you know? I mean, imagine I won in 2016, how that would have been. Yeah. No one, no one's ever repeated from South Africa, gone back and, 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 and reclaimed their gold medal. So for me, um, it would have been absolutely life-changing, you know, to win in 2016. But you know, again, it, it is what it is. Things happen for a reason. But, uh, you know, it's uh, it's just sad to see how whoever's running the show, right, they're killing generations of swimmers by letting these guys get off the hook, you know. Yeah. I mean, and I think and I truly believe the way to punish these cheats is just to ban them. You know, you can ban them for eight years. It doesn't matter. The man, I mean, he got he got something like 20 million rand after winning uh, – 20 million dollars, sorry, after winning uh, – gold in uh, or 10 million and 10 million after the last couple of Olympics. So, I mean, he, he's living on the beach. He's, he's chilling, you know, he doesn't have to work. You know what I mean? He's no repercussions, you know, whatever, but, but he should be taken away. Not, not about the money. He should be taken away. His, uh, his legacy should be taken away. Like Lance Armstrong. Did. Exactly. His seven tour de France should be taken away. I'm not a money driven swimmer. I don't, I don't really care about money to be very honest with you. Of course, you, you know, money is important, but I care about legacy. Yeah. You know, I care about being the best, uh, the best that I can be, the best uh, uh, Olympian or the best uh, athlete South Africa's ever had. That's that's my ultimate goal one day. You know, I want I want to go down in history in ten years when I retire. Hopefully, if I can uh, go on that long, I want to be known as one of the greats. You know, Gary Player. You know, all these legends that have gone through. You yeah. know, so well, speaking of that legacy, uh, the Olympic Games has been postponed for a year. We were supposed to be in Tokyo in a couple of months' time. How much has that affected 
your outlook? Because obviously you're going to be a year older, whether that means you're better or worse, I don't know. You can maybe tell us. Uh, do you think it maybe suits you, the fact that there's an extra year to prepare? You're going to be a year older or will it work against you? How do you feel? Because uh, as you say, these things are out of your control. You can only manage now what, what's before you and that's another year to get ready. Um, so where do you, what are your feelings on the postponement of the Olympics? Well, to be very honest with you, uh, I think, look, a, a news came, it was a bit of a shock, obviously, because we prepared so well, you know, this, this year has been outstanding for me, you know, last year was quite a bad year for me. I had a really bad groin injury and I've been nursing that for a long time. I mean, I've had this injury for a long, long time. You know, that's why I've actually stopped swimming. The, Is that a swimming injury? Well, I actually hurt it from football like about 10 years ago, but, but the problem was I never really rehabbed it properly. So I was kind of, even in 2012, I swam the, the 400 medley and I came fifth. Not many people even know that. But, you know, I had no real breaststroke back in the day. And I mean, I would I would love to swim the medley. I mean, I, my, my goal in 2016 was to go and win the medleys as well as the butterflies. Right. But I, ha I have no breaststroke. I stopped swimming in 2015 because of the groin. it became so chronic, so bad. And, I, and it came back again last year, really, really bad, where I actually couldn't kick at all for about uh, 12 weeks last year. I, just, I, couldn't, I couldn't do any push off the wall. So, I mean, I was literally pushing off with my, with my tiptoes. So you can imagine how annoying that is swimming every day. Yeah. Have to start 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 at dead start. You know, for me, I I live on my underwaters and my legs. You know, my my, my secret is my underwaters in my legs. So for me, it was just a nightmare for me. Um, this January to to March was just outstanding. I had such a great preparation. But for me, uh, I look everything as a positive. You know, like it's twelve more months, and I think for me, uh, I, I said a joke to my dad uh, and my coach. I said. <laughs> I said, I'm I'm getting younger each year, man. I said, I'm getting, I have so much more to learn. I'm I'm improving still. I'm I'm 29 next year. Yeah, I just turned 28 two days ago. But uh, oh, happy birthday for that, by the way. Thank you, thank you. Yes, uh, <laughs> I'm uh, I'm I'm getting younger. I'm, my competitors are um, both of them are the world record holder. They beat Phelps' world records, by the way. Uh, Crystal Milak and, and Caleb Dressel, they're both uh, mm. unbelievable talents, right? Uh, they're both 20. 23 and 20 or just turned 20. So I, I, I said, yeah, it's, it's good for me. They, they're getting older next year. I'm getting younger, you know? <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm very happy. I'm very positive. And, and look, at the end of the day, um, like I said earlier, you know, I, I have to, I can only prepare how I can prepare. You know, I can't, I can't speak for what they're doing. You know, I can't, I can't account for what, you know, 2016, I, I did my best turn of freestyle ever, you know? And, and it's unfortunate that Sun Yang came past me. I can't account for what other people are doing. If, yeah. if Mila can address or go, one second faster in the world record and something crazy, some crazy time. I mean, I'm not going to beat them. You know what I mean? If I do my best time and I'm knocking on the door and I get close to the world record and I swim a great race and they beat me, there's nothing I can do. The only thing I can do is take my hats off to them and be proud of my performance because I did my best. Yeah. You know yeah. what I'm saying? And, that, and, that, and, that, and that's not going to decide on me. I said, after 2016, the people that know me after 2016, my first interviews that I did, you know, everyone was talking, a lot of people, uh, we're saying, oh, that's the last turn of fly. You'll see Chad do, you know, he's going to be focusing on the hundreds. Man, are you crazy? <laughs> that's not where I come from. I'm coming back stronger. I'm coming for that turn of fly, even though, you know, this young boy came out of, out of nowhere and, you know, he's, uh, he broke Phelps' world record. It was, it was truly one of the best uh, swimming performances of all time that I've ever witnessed. That was last he year. He smashed it by about seven tenths of a second, which is massive. It, it, was, it, was, it was crazy, crazy. So, I mean, understand this is Phelps' world record from back in 2009. Uh, when he had the suits on, you know, so his swim was just, yeah, it was truly breathtaking, you know, and, uh, you know, he still, he was only 19 at the time. So for me, you must understand the underdog that I am going into the Olympics next year. Like, it's crazy, the underdog that I am. It's a bigger underdog than I was in 2012 when I was unknown. You know, for, for him to lose this turn of flights, it's, it's crazy. But what I will say is, you know, <laughs> I'm coming for every one of them with all due respects. I say that I say that with absolute respect. I'm not trying to create a rivalry, or I'm not trying to say anything bad yet. But I, I, I'm I'm training as hard as I possibly can. And again, I have I have no right to win next year. I really don't. With these two young boys that have both Phelps' world records under their belts, everything going for them, I should not win any butterfly event for as long as they're swimming. But I can promise you now, <laughs> there's only one man that you have to fear, and that's a man that never gives up. And that's always what I say. I will keep coming back. And if it's not next year, I'll be 32 years old. I promise you, I will be there. <laughs> I will be there and I'll be coming back. So um, it's not over for me, you know. So so uh, I'm still very green in the sport and I, I have a lot to learn. And, and, and uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm a white belt in terms of, uh, in terms of swimming and I'm still, uh, I'm still learning every day and I have great people and great coaches around me and I'm, 
I'm swimming in an amazing team and uh, I'm not just saying this to be positive. I'm saying this, I'm saying this out of real, you know, I'm being real here, you know, and, and, and I really believe that uh, the best is yet to come from, from my side. That's fantastic. In terms of training, I, I remember speaking to Roland Skuman after he was part of that relay team that won the four by 100 in uh, Athens, which was such a great night for swimming as well. And I asked him just about training. You guys spend hours and hours swimming up and down in the pool uh, and, and I said, what goes through your mind? How do you stay motivated? How do you um, get into that water every day and swim for two, three, four hours, however long it is? And, and what do you, what goes through your mind when you're doing that? And, and, you know, he gave a few answers. But the one thing that stuck out with me, he said, you know, for some laps, maybe for 15 minutes or so, he would just concentrate on how his pinky is hitting the water to make sure that his stroke's right. You just focus on that for 10 laps or so and then on something else. Do you do something similar when you're training? I think that's a, that's a great answer, actually, from Roland. I think from our side, um, you know, he's, a, he's obviously a, a pure sprinter, you know, so he was a really 50-meter specialist and 100-meter specialist, so his details need to be absolutely perfect. And and back in the day when Roland had his, uh, you know, he had the best start in the world. Everyone learned the start from him, you know. Yeah. All the guys from today, I mean, his start was really, truly unbelievable. In 2003 to 2006, there was no one better than him, you know, and um I focus. I'm not. I'm not a very technical swimmer. Yeah. <laughs> James, my coach, always says he gives the warm up. You know, and he goes, "Okay, 400 swim, 200 kick, uh, 400 boy, and then you're gonna go uh, 450s uh, drill." He says, "He'll say, Chad, 400 swim, 200 kick, 400 boy, and then he says, 200 choice <laughs> in the warm up because he knows I don't really like doing too much drills. So from my side, um, you know, when I do do drills, I do them properly and I focus very hard. But I'm I'm not a guy that likes to focus too much on them. Every day, I work more on because obviously I'm a turned swimmer, which is like, uh, you know, it's like running the 400 and, and running or or the 800. You know, it's 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 the hardest uh, event because you need to have speed and endurance. So I work on a bit of everything all the time. So I'm constantly working on my speed, my endurance, my starts, my turns, my skills, my VO2 max, my threshold, uh, my anaerobic, my aerobic capacity. So I'm always working something. Whereas, again, with respect to sprinters, you know, you get a guy like, uh, you know, I can. You know Ben Proud, who's a uh, you know one of the best fifty freestylers in the world. He swims with us. Um, he gyms every single day for like two hours, type of thing. Whereas I gym, you know, uh, three times a week yeah. for about an hour. Okay. You know, and 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 two of those sessions are more core sessions. I don't really do weights. You know, so he does heavy heavy weights every single day, like a bodybuilder type vibe. <laughs> but he swims, he swims like two k's. Uh, he'll swim like maybe three k's at most a, a day. Sometimes even like 800 meters a day, whereas I swim uh, anything from 12 to 14 k's. So if that puts it into context, you know. Every day. Yeah, yeah. So I, I mean, I swim something like 45 to 65 k's a week in six days. That's what I swim. Yeah. So 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 it's completely different. So he'll swim something like 10 to 18 k's in a week, you know. <laughs> so you know but he gyms like a crazy person how are you doing swimming in lockdown uh i mean you obviously don't have a, an olympic pool in your back garden uh, so how do you sort of put those k's in during lockdown yeah it's, it's difficult at the moment um yeah it's, it's really really hard i mean i've got a little small pool which i'm paddling in for like 40 minutes a day you know with a little cord around my, my waist but uh we're doing a lot of kind of land-based work so we're doing a lot of core every day uh, a lot of leg work, uh, rehabbing my groin even more, uh, push-ups, pull-ups. Uh, luckily, I got some medicine balls before Sportsman's Warehouse uh, went, uh, <laughs> sold everything out. As the lockdown was announced, I went to Sportsman's. I got some weights and free weights and some Swiss balls and medicine balls. And, you know, I just kind of got a little home gym, you know. Yeah. Um, but nothing really crazy. I mean, it's, it's you just got to really, you got to do what you can do now in this time. You know, it's a, it's a difficult time for everyone. Look, my family's safe. That's the most important thing. And then, you know, when we can train again, we'll be ready to go. Yeah. And we don't know what the season's going to bring. You know, the Olympic Games was the central point. That's gone. Will there be other meetings later in the year? Uh, if, let's say, we come out of lockdown in July or something uh, globally, will there, will there be meet, meets that you can race in in October or November, somewhere around there? I think there's going to be a meet, uh, well, hopefully with the International Swimming League, the ISL. They, they had their first uh, tournaments last year, which was a huge, huge success. It's like a Premier League for swimming, where there's club-based swimmers, and we uh, it's like a transfer window, and every every club gets a budget, and uh, you can kind of like uh, buy your swimmers, you know, for the for the league. And uh, it was supposed to be a league actually starting off the Olympics in September, going all the way through to April, right. racing every two couple of weeks. You know, there would be like I think ten matches each team, and then there'll be a final in April in Vegas. So uh, it's a really really cool league that's happening now. Uh, but that might only be happening in October for one month. We might be going to uh, 
one location in the world if it's if it's possible. So that's the only thing that I know of. Yeah. Um, and there is a potentially a FINA swimming world short course championships in Abu Dhabi in December. Hopefully that's still on. But uh, we'll kind of see what, where that goes with, I'm not sure. Chad, we could uh, discuss a lot of things. It's a great pleasure to have had you on the Maverick Sports Podcast. And yeah, good luck with training in lockdown and everything that you're building towards the Olympics next year. And hopefully we'll have another one of those golden nights as South Africans to celebrate. Thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Thank, thank, big pleasure. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. This podcast is made possible by our Maverick Insiders, and please consider becoming part of our Maverick Insider community, where, for a nominal fee every month, you're supporting quality independent journalism. You also get some cool benefits, such as Uber vouchers, when the coronavirus pandemic subsides, and engagement with our journalists thrown in. Please go to dailymaverick.co.za forward slash insider to sign up and become part of the Maverick Insider community. I'm Craig Gray. Thanks so much for joining us this week. If you're the kind of person that listens to the end of podcasts, you can help us spread the word by rating us in your podcast app and sharing this episode with someone you know. We'd be very grateful.